Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here with a really important Word Balloon today. Uh, we're just over a week uh, before Election Day, and uh, we got a great panel here to talk about the strange history of voting in comics. It really does go back to the Golden Age. Hell, actually, before the Golden Age of comics, and uh, some uh, evidence that uh, our, our, our linchpin uh, dug up, uh, he always creates incredible uh, collections of comics and continue to explore uh, areas of, of uh, the history of comics that uh, could have gotten neglected if it wasn't for his efforts. It's Craig Yo, everybody. Good to see you, Craig. Oh, thanks for that nice introduction. And, and thanks for bringing on these other stellar stars here with me. Wow, you're making me look good. Uh, they're making me look good. Uh, you know, my, I got my buddy Sanford Green, who, uh, of course, uh, right now is uh, uh, doing the victory lap for his excellent uh, collections of uh, bitter root and, and the like. Uh, well done, Sanford. Congratulations. Uh, thanks, John. Um, hey, it, it just seems like yesterday that we uh, hung out, man. Big kind of. Uh, so, well, we, we were both yesterday. Yeah, we were we were both hanging out in Baltimore in different uh, virtual rooms. But uh, you did a hell of a job, you and. Uh, and Chuck and uh, David and uh, and Shelley, I really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, uh, for for audio uh, listeners, a future episode of Word Balloon coming in the days and weeks ahead. There's a lot of content we're going to get through from Baltimore Comic Con, and I'll be sharing with you in the days ahead. And uh, last but certainly not least, and I've been wanting to talk to her for a long time, Emil Ferris, an incredible cartoonist, uh, Chicago, uh, and, and and really a very accomplished uh, person. It's it's a pleasure to meet you, Emil. Welcome. It's lovely to meet you as well. John, thank you. And it's well, great to, I mean, this is my first time meeting. I know uh, Craig. You can uh, call me Yo. Yeah, I know Yo. I know, I'm from Chicago there. I know Yo, but, uh, but I <laughs> heard and admired his work. So it's really, really nice to uh, meet thank you, you. And, and meet you all. Yeah, and John, your show is great. I enjoyed the beginning oh. an awful lot again. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, it's all my... It's my kind of stuff, you know. So I, I do know that's fantastic. Seriously, I, I love that. And uh, then, of course, hey, we're both Chicago people. We all, unfortunately, we know all about uh, voting and voting chicanery, obviously. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Vote early and vote often. I shouldn't say that. I didn't mean oh. that. <laughs> no, 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 no. And well, we, uh, Emil and I will stay out of the Chicago graveyards yeah. collecting votes yeah. as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> What are you gonna do? What are you? I, I, mean, used live, <laughs> I used to live in Chicago, so I I think there's still people voting in my name there, probably. Oh sure. <laughs> I mean, not let's, well. uh, let's hope not. But yeah, I understand <laughs> that. I totally understand. Where'd you live in Chicago, Craig? Uh, well, I worked at Marvin Glass, the first and largest toy think tank right in Chicago. But I I lived in the burbs. Oh, nice. Uh, Which what 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 burb? Well, I lived in Elgin for a while and Dundee for a while. Great. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. Emil, your- like what part of what part of the city are you in? I'm in I'm in um, Roscoe Village. Oh, you're in Roscoe Village. Oh yeah, I love Roscoe Village. Um, yeah. right now I'm right on the border of Chicago and Evanston. Hey, awesome. God, I like Rogers Park kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, honestly, I used to live in Evanston just north of Rogers Park and right, right by the old newsstand that was there at Chicago and Maine. I love that newsstand. It's still here. They brought it back. Yeah. No, is, yeah. you know, oh, hey, look, all right, everyone. For, I was going to say, forgive me, because it always was. It was such a great newsstand in terms of the international reach that, that they would provide. Is it is it still like that? Right. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's great. Fantastic. That's great to hear. It's, it's, oh my god. It's a good thing to have. And I think it's something that's missing in a lot of cities, you know. Absolutely. Oh, I I went to New York City uh to see uh, Neil Adams the other uh but he had he didn't arrive to the office uh right on time. So I just kind of wandered the streets around his office and there's all these storefronts that call the newsstand and their magazines and you know, they're, they're, that's the name of in the in the t- title of their stores, and I walked into a few of them. Not one magazine, not one, not even one newspaper, just lotto tickets and uh, uh, smoking supplies for stuff, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and- there's, but they, but they, you know, you used to be wander into them and get all these international magazines and everything like they, they don't even carry the New York Times. Wow. I'm, I'm not surprised. You know, Emil and I know downtown Chicago uh, has tons of empty or what were kiosks kind of filled with newspapers of all kinds. And, and now they're real estate ads and just anything but a newspaper. And right. I don't even know if that one, because I, I stopped working near the Hancock uh, a while ago, but there was one active newspaper newsstand left. And it right. always seemed to me that it was tourists that were there and not real Chicagoans yeah. buying <laughs> buying magazines and stuff. So uh, I haven't seen a newsstand in at least 10 years. The only newsstand I've seen recently is the one behind me. And that's not even really a newsstand. <laughs> it's been a rat. It's <laughs> been a rat. But really? um, yeah. I love that. You got the whole thing. <laughs> hey. Thank you. <laughs> hey, the, I I um I think on um during the uh, Ringo's, I was scrambling, trying to make sure that I got that in a nice view of everyone because everything to the right of me, yes, to the, yeah, the left of me is pure chaos. So we figured <laughs> you, know, you got the <laughs> I totally My studio did. is just uh, filled, filled with books because, you know, of course, COVID has shut down all of all of the year um so conventions are completely shut down and so my my studio is now a distribution center and uh <laughs> and the like so well, we're, we're moving pretty soon and the real estate photographers came to take pictures for a house and all my friends are saying oh my god your house is so spotless and clean well the the, the photographers come in and they move all your shit shit you or whatever i'm allowed to say, you say to one side of the room and photograph the other side and then they move that stuff to the other side and then do another uh, another snapshot so but it, it, they make your house look really clean but uh yeah. there, should, <laughs> there should be you know german is such a great language for having these big long composite words we need a word that means that joy you have for the week after you've packed or like you find things you know that's just like this oh yeah 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 i mean there's this point where you're like i was looking for this for the whole time i lived in this place and you know you finally find it, or I don't know. There's just got to be some way that we deal with all of it. We live in as artists, especially we live in so much chaos. You know, I've, I've been, been collecting stuff, collecting comics and art for sixty years, and going through lots of stuff to to get ready to move. Like I didn't know I had that. I never knew this exi- that book even existed. And where did I have that book? <laughs> you know, I, I I find stuff that I you know hasn't been seen for literally decades and well, that's uh, I, I was I gonna live, say that go ahead Sanford. no i was gonna say i i live for the the day that um when when we move that i will find um uh, this video that i filmed at uh c2e2 i don't know when when it was the date but stanley was the guest of honor and oh. i got a chance to film him signing books 
and he gives a shout out to my kids and my wife. Oh, you got to find great. that. And so it's somewhere in here, but I know <laughs> the only way that I will find it is I got to move. <laughs> That's when I'll find it because it's, it's. I think I saw your wife selling that on eBay last week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I highly doubt it. She 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 barely knows who Stanley is, let alone. Oh, so, no kidding. No, all, 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 all jokes aside, she she knows Stanley. I mean, everybody. Yeah, of course, I understand. <laughs> well, I was going to say metaphorically, uh, Craig, uh, the fact that you're uh, discovering things that you didn't know you had before and stuff—that's kind of a good metaphor for really your career path and what you've done with these <laughs> incredibly incredible trades. And truly now uh, the book is called voting is your superpower. And it's, yes. got, it's got an amazing Sanford green cover. Oh, that's the best part. And then it kind of goes downhill after that. Stop. But no, honestly, yeah, yeah, I was going to say your Sanford's yeah. cover. There we go. There it is. Uh, nice. Sanford. Well done. Agreed. My friend. Thank you. I'm impressed. And Great. I'm not easily impressed. And Emil, are you? I mean, I, I mean, I know with Monsters, your incredible award-winning book as well. I, I uh, are, you, are you are you in the book, or are you just here as an advocate, obviously, of as a comic person, letting everyone know, hey, we got to vote. I'm just an advocate. She, she's on the back of the book. Oh, I that's the back her. cover. Excuse me. Yeah. Oh, so I asked, I asked her for a quote, and she said, "If oh. if voting didn't matter, there wouldn't be any. There wouldn't be folks attempting with a whole host of dirty tricks." No from Chicago, to suppress it. That tells you that voting, that your vote matters. As John Lewis said, the right to vote is precious, almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool or instrument in a democratic society. We must use it. This wonderful book, Voting is Your Superpower, drives that truth home like few other books have. Read this book, March, and vote. So Good she's words. on the back cover. Good words. I like it. Yeah, well, I I know. tried to show show uh, give visual aid, and it was a poor attempt at doing that. <laughs> out of focus. Oh my God. <laughs> but if you, you know when you when you held up the back cover though with a mule's quote on it, you know who did that drawing? Who? Uh, okay, we'll see who guesses it first. Birthday boy. Oh, I don't Birthday know. Boy R related. Closely related to someone oh, that that, I know San, now. that Sanford just mentioned. Oh, Stanley yeah. Lieber. Yeah, Larry Lieber. Larry, Larry, Larry Lieber. Yeah. yeah, he he did the back cover. Larry Lieber, the, seriously, one of the most fascinating uh, creators in comics. Given that he stands brother, the almost anonymity that he uh, lives in, and I, Danny Finger and off and I talked about that in terms of like, tell me everything about Larry Lieber. I actually have. You can see it right there where my finger is. Those are two Spider-Man <laughs> daily comics, oh, and no, and um, and uh, Stan wrote the dialogue. Larry did the pencils, and uh, Alex Saviak uh, did the uh, the inking over it. Very and good. I, oh my god! It's and I'm friends with Alex. That's how I got it. But I do love that I own a piece of uh, all three of their uh, art together in that collaboration. So from well, I I met him for the first time a couple of years ago at a New Jersey convention. And finally got his signature on a, a piece I got a, a number of years back. It's the it's the original artwork where Fin Fan Foom comes to life. And, uh, you know, Marvel's most famous monster. And I bought that at a New York comic convention that was in a little hotel. And the guy wanted $75 for this Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Dick Ayers, Larry Lieber piece. And I said, uh, I don't know, would you take 50 bucks? And so we settled at 65. And right after I bought it, I was going up the little aisle in that hotel ballroom and I run into Jack Kirby. And I go, Jack, look what I just got. And he, 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 he took it. And I thought, oh man, he took it and he's not going to give it back. <laughs> Jack wants his art back. But uh, he goes, oh, this is great. I'm really glad you got this, Craig. And, and uh, he said, would you like me to sign it? And I said, oh yeah, that'd be great. So he, he signed up. Uh, the page where Finn Fan Foom comes to life. Later on, I interviewed Stan, Stan Lee uh, right after he, he met Sanford and family. Uh, Sanford and son and wife. Isn't there a TV show about Sanford and son and wife and meeting well, Stan Lee? Uh, no, wife. Wife. No, no wife. <laughs> so I got Stan Lee to, uh, to sign it. And then Dick Ayers came and visited me once. He lived not too, about 10, 15 minutes from me here. And uh, but I, I was always missing Larry Lieber, but I finally got him to sign it. Uh, 
last week. So I got all, all four guys on that Fin Fan Foom page. It, it's kind That's of awesome. exciting to me. As a young fanboy, I always liked Fin Fan Foom, and I do to this day. Emil, I, like, do you have any like uh, old like uh, pages or commission art? Do you like? Do you go to any of your favorite artists and and get stuff? Or even as a fellow artist, have you been gifted uh, pieces? I have been gifted, and also um, I have just uh, I've fallen in love with some work that uh, I'm I'm buying. Um, okay. I, there are some people who work. I, I like. Um, Thomas Ott and Nina Bunjavak's work very, very cool. much. Uh, Lorenzo uh, Matodi's work. Um, wow. I love his work. Um, yeah, there are a lot of people whose work I, I want, you know, all the time when I go to shows, uh, especially in, in Europe, I see few things I want, but I'd see them here too. I just don't go to very many Comic Cons here. I haven't been but to you read, And the yeah, ones you read my I've been, it's been too busy for me to really look at the art, and I would have loved sure. it. I, I couldn't. I kind of suspected that you were going to the European shows, Samuel. Uh, like, uh, tell us. Obviously, I'm guessing Angoulême and, and maybe Luca. But tell me, yeah, tell me of the other great shows that you've been to abroad, especially yeah. given our current state, you know, state of uh, being in terms of God only knows we won't be able to do that again. Right. No, it's been it's been uh, it's been a shame. There have been a lot of things I wish were happening, but you know. It's okay. but, you, but you did go to a lot of shows. I mean, you were like a, a, a superstar at these shows in Europe and, and beyond, right? It was wild. It was yeah. wild. That's excellent. Well, was, again. And you must have a giant, you must have had, to, you must have like a, a six mantle pieces installed in your home with all the awards that you have to put on them. See it for two. You won a Ringo. The, the, you guys are like big time just, award winners. Absolutely. I, it's what do you, I don't know. You know, I, I kind of look at them all and think. Uh, oh, you know, here, really? I mean, every now and then I keep. Happen? I mean, it's uh, still. You look at them and think what, Emil? She, she's shocked, I guess. That, you know, yeah. Oh, I just, it amazes me. Yeah, well, we're, yeah. we're not, uh, us re readers of your work, we're not amazed that you're getting all this acclaim. Absolutely. And, and again, for Sanford, that. too. I know Sanford, like, in the last year, he's won Eisner's and Ringo's. And, yeah. and uh, his yeah. wife still makes him take out the garbage. But uh, it, it, it And, you know, that that's the way it should be done, I guess. That's how it should be. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that brings balance in the world, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, like you guys said, it's, it is pretty surreal. But I think what we're doing right now, um, I think I tweeted this out few days ago, uh, besides Bitterroot um, being a part of this project, uh, when, when Craig reached out to me about uh, being a part of it, I think we originally talked about doing like a spot, spot illustration or something like that. And yeah. it just kind of grew from there to where, you know, it just kind of made sense. Well, the reason why I think I was, uh, I had the fortune of doing the cover is the subject matter, or at least the content that's in the book. Um, there's a lot of, which I wasn't aware of, Craig, um, found, um, I guess an archived collection of NAACP comic strips that, uh, informs, uh, the public on voting. And I'm like, wow, that, that just fascinated me simply because of the, uh, the, the subject matter. So I was on board because of that. And um, we just started talking and passing ideas back and forth about what would be a great representation to connect what I do to the content that was uh, that was it, uh, within the book. So you know, um, yeah, it was just um, uh, an extreme honor. And I've got people that aren't <clears throat> into comics or anything; they're fascinated by this book because of the fact that it does speak on, you know, the political and, and social issues. And when I first got the book, actually, I, I, I was thumbing through it the other day. And, you know, there are comic strips in there from the 1930s that are absolutely prevalent I know. to today. And I'm like, this is absolutely insane. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's a good thing. Right. I mean, some of it can be if you look at the fact that we're, you know, we're 
we're um, aware of these these um, concerns of voter suppression and things yes. of that nature. But the the mere fact that we st we're still talking about this um, has it been truly dealt with? That that was a part that um, was convicting. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I, just to be able to have those that conversation with people that aren't comic readers to, to, you know, educate them on here is an actual comic that's dealing with subject matter that is very uh, relevant to and, and important to, you know, your personal interests, you yes. know? Um, so yeah, it, uh, yeah, it was pretty fulfilling. You know, it's interesting that the, the, you know, as a historian, you dig into things and you try to find things and these voting comic books, we, we reprint eight comic books in full in this book. And they were actually very, uh, 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 there's one that's not so rare, but the rest of them were like, were super hard to find. And uh, the, the, the way the NAACP came into this was an interesting thing because one comic I heard about, but couldn't find at all was, was this one, on, uh, uh, an American family gets out the vote. And you see what, you know, the typical uh, American family looks like, you know, all white bread. <laughs> yeah, and I've seen people, Harriet. And all the people uh, going to vote, are, they're all white. But if you look real closely, go back in, please. Right here. Uh, At the bottom. See where there's a rubber, a red rubber stamp there? What's that? Oh, stamp? yes, it does. Yeah. Publisher there, action. In the red letters, it says... Yeah. Uh, Oh, I'm not holding this up very good. Oh, there it is at the very bottom. Sure, NAACP. Yeah. There we yeah, go. Yeah, there we go. There it is. Yep. So the NAACP to get out the vote was using this this all white bread comic book to get out the vote because that's all they had, and they knew the importance of getting out the vote and uh, for their community, but they didn't have any tools for it. But so they were, you know, buying these uh, comics. To, to pass out in their community to get out the vote but and stamping the NAACP stamp on it. But it must have given them an idea. That idea must have lodged in their head like, hey, these comics, even though they're all, you know, white folk, it, 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 they're effective. And, uh, you know, they maybe even won some elections because of them. So that's when they started doing their own uh, uh, comic books. And so that's, that's uh, one of those was... Uh, this comic a superhero well no there's first oh i was one. excuse me i was i was going to the end of the book it's Stay called me. the street where you live indeed and it's a beautiful comic book and it's done by uh, uh a guy who went on to become a famous children's book artist he didn't do a lot of comics but his name was tom feelings and he was uh his the, the comics in here are beautiful because they're very natural they really reflect uh the attitude and, and, and the beauty, you know, uh, of, of his people. And uh, they were effective in getting out the vote. So, uh, and, and then he went on to win a, a, a Coretta Scott King uh, award, I think three or four times or something, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, he did that, work. Yeah, um, he, I think he's most known for uh, Middle Passage. Um, is that a kid's book or what is that, Sanford? It was a kid's, it, it, it is a kid's book. Um, right. Actually, kind of an interest, interesting side note to Tom Feelings. My art mentor is really good friends with Tom Feelings. Really? Uh, yeah. My, my, um, now, Tom's mentor, gone now, but yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. they were, they were good friends. Um, oh, and my cool. art mentor put, put me on to Tom Feelings when I was in school. Is that's your amazing. mentor, is your mentor still around? Oh yeah, he's he's phenomenal. He he does a lot of as a matter of fact, speaking of just the subject matter that we're talking about now using art to make political statements, that's 90% of what he does now. He used to be um, a professor, retired, and he just does exhibitions now. Um Well, you'll you know, have to send him this book. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and let him know that his old buddy Tom Feelings is in it. Yeah, as yeah. as uh, saying what's his name Sanford, your mentor. Uh, Tyrone Jeter. It's uh, like Derek Jeter, sure. uh, last name. But um, oh, I'm sorry, it's G E T E R. Okay. Yeah, 
and mm. uh, Tyrone Jeter. But uh, yeah, he's he's incredible. His work is phenomenal. Um, I tried to get him to do a, a variant cover for Bitter Root, and he <laughs> he said, um, you know, don't hold your breath. But we'll see. <laughs> we, we, I might be able to get him at some point. His work is incredible, though. He does oil. He's a lot. He 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 falls under kind of a John Singer Sergeant. If you're mm. familiar with his work, yeah, his you beautiful know, work. Yeah, beautiful work. Um, oil. He does oils. He can do wow pastel. He can do charcoal. Up uh, all this incredible work. But um, yeah, yeah. So there's a kind of a a connection. Two degree, yeah, two degree separation, if you will. That's outstanding. That's fantastic. Well, then, if I can then just for a second to go back to Birthday Boy Larry Lieber, then the NAACP teamed up uh, with Marvel Comics uh, later on uh, as the as the civil rights movement was really getting rolling. Because uh, that first one was in 1960. This comic is from 1964. It's called The Future Rests in Your Hands. And uh, we found this was another harder one to find, but we found a collector who had a signed copy by Larry Lieber. Oh, that's great. And uh, Larry Larry penciled and and probably inked it with maybe a little help from EC artist Marie Severin, uh, but uh, we we think Stan Lee wrote it, but we we don't know that for sure. But it sure reads like a Stan Lee comic. So uh, wow, so no. that's, so that's pretty cool. But it's a, a really rare Marvel. You talk about uh, it, yeah. it's a heck of a lot rarer than Fantastic Four number one or Spider Man number one or even Captain America number one. It's like. It, copies are really, really difficult to find, but we were at the last second we were able to finally wrestle one to the ground through a, a guy by name Barry Pearl, who generously lent his signed copy to us. Uh, was Craig um, first on that? Uh, the I don't know if it was uh, the feature, the Lieber feature, or the previous one. The lead character that's there's a moment there's a community leader that's trying to convince uh oh. you know the people to vote and i felt even though his name was yes that that image right there hold on one this second guy he looks like yeah. uncle, uncle sam well you know honestly <laughs> I, I facially I, doesn't he kind of and i wondered if it was modeled after adam clayton powell oh i bet you you're know? right i i think you I know think you might be right mm. and maybe and may, you know I, I don't know if maybe that was the uh, intent and and uh well, i wouldn't be surprised you know but uh you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a history buff. And, and again, this is why I really respect what you do, Craig, because you do. you As I said at the beginning, and I mean it, you find these amazing little avenues of comics that, you know, have, have gone un, unnoticed for, for decades. And I'm glad you're finding these things. So um, how difficult, I mean, what, you know, did you want to do the book and then started searching? Or did you come across one or two books and thought maybe there's more out there? So well, yeah, what was the inspiration for this? Well, I've always loved giveaway comic books. That's a, it's a, that's talk about un, an unknown uh, aspect of comics history. And uh, I, I have a friend who who was helping me do a book on giveaway comics, which I'm still working on. And he he estimates there's over twenty five thousand of them. So like you know, talk about wow. a major part of comics that nobody knows about. There's twenty five thousand plus comics no one knows about. And they're very, again, they are very rare. But I start, I've been working on this book for for oh, 10 years, but more heavily last year or so. And so all of a sudden, in trying to accumulate stuff for the book, I, I found a couple of voting comic books. As, you know, in the last four years, I've been thinking about voting and getting these vote, comics about voting. And so I thought, like, geez, we should put out a book quick and, you know, do our part to get out the vote. And uh, so, so that's kind of how it came apart. Uh, uh, but I, I kept kind of kept getting a little little thicker because I kept finding new comics. And at the very last second, I found another uh, black uh, community oriented one, uh, and it's called uh, Vote. There man. he is. Yes, indeed, Voter Man. V Vote Man. Vote Man. Excuse me. And it was by a, a Marvel writer, uh, and uh, he wrote Sergeant Fury, Alan uh, Kurzrock, and. Uh, it's the first. Uh, it's it's the first black superhero comic, black superhero to have his own title because people ascribe that to other people because this 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 was unknown until I was thankfully able to dig this up. So now we've pinpointed that it is the first black superhero comic. So that you know I'm kind of excited about that that it's included in the book. So what do you think, Emil? Yeah, I was going to ask. Please. 
Emil, oh, are you, you're there, right? Oh. <laughs> Wake up, Emil. I'm We're boring you to death. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, we want. Me at all. What, 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 uh, what? Honestly, like, what, what attracted you to get involved? And, in, and really, I mean, are you, are you uh, an old school? Like, I mean, uh, you know, uh, how far back and what, and what areas of comic history interest you? Well, really, I'm uh, catching up because there are a lot of things I don't know about. I liked Spider Man an awful lot, cool. and uh, I was a kid was a big fan of Batman. Um, but I really, there's so much more that I never knew about. Yeah. So I had a friend of mine whose name is, uh, Casey, uh, who runs the Olympia. He runs a comic shop in Olympia. You know, he's one of the organizers for the Olympia comic con. And he sent me three amazing books and I'm going to look at them right now. They're right here because I occasionally... I don't know. Let's see. I've got one right here. I'm finding I'm finding them wonderful. I've got Ecstatics right here. Nice. Whoa. That I am reading. Yeah. And uh, I'm loving it. You know, I'm loving uh, <laughs> I'm loving Dead Girl just an awful lot. Sure. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, no, I'm totally into it. But you know, I didn't. I had years where I wasn't really doing that. And um, I can't see you guys anymore, so it's a little weird. We, 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 had you, we had you oh, solo there, there with, the, with the books, but, yeah, I was just letting you talk. <laughs> That's all right. We didn't leave you. Another, Don't worry. Another couple after I finish this one, I get more. And it's almost, like, it's almost like, you know, when you, like what you were saying, Craig, where it's almost like I found money in a jacket pocket. Do you know what I mean? Like a lot of money, like $1,000. You know, imagine that. Because there are all kinds of amazing things I've never read. And it's just like. I have regressed. I am now 12 and I'm just like enjoying the hell out of it during, uh, during quarantine. I, you know, I eat really stupid food. Like I eat spoonfuls of peanut butter and I, and it's like, I really, it is like I am 12 and read comics <laughs> and I'm, I'm hey. books. I love it. I mean, I'm you like, are 12. so happy. <laughs> you know, there's, some, like, there's some I online, so, there's some online counseling that you could get. To. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> no like I, the contrary. Yeah. The I, I don't think, I don't think she's alone in that matter. No, I was going to no. say, you know, the no. numbers have come out and truly uh, sales are up because everyone is doing that. Yeah. And, and of course they are. I mean, it's like, sadly, it's like a perpetual sales are up rating. Pe with peanut butter or book? Or well, I, I think probably both, but, uh, oh, but okay. obviously with comics because it's a perpetual rainy day. We have to stay inside. Oh, yeah. And and so, know. you know, yeah, it, it no, I'm reading I'm reading more than I ever have and I'm buying more than I ever have. And, I, and that's good. And I certainly hope that's Helping the shops and uh, and and the publishers and yo books and certainly yo books absolutely <laughs> man you know someone asked earlier uh, and here we go so where where can we get our our hands on this Craig oh there's a couple good places uh, uh, Amazon in their wisdom are going to have it like two or three weeks after the election oh <laughs> but if you, but if you want uh, one right away I would suggest you uh, go to the, my co-publisher is Clover Press the fine people there. Ted and Robbie at Clover Press, uh, they, they used to be the, the founders and heads of uh, IDW, and now they start a wonderful uh, small press called Clover Press. And if you go to cloverpress.us, uh, it's available there. And if you're a customer of the, the uh, esteemed and wonderful person, Bud Plant, and his Bud Plant books, uh, he's featuring it uh, right now. And it's only like $12.99. And uh, if, you got, if you contact those, Either one of those uh, fine establishments uh, right away, uh, they'll get you one before the election. So you can uh, have something to read while you're standing in line. You want me to include uh, Bud Plant uh, comics there then on that scroll that I'm uh, running right oh, now? Oh, I'm sure Bud would appreciate it. And I, sure. It would be a splendid idea. And, uh, and then, and then cloverpress.us too. Yep. Uh, and uh, could, could, if we could go back a second, I, I want people to look at, well, well, especially when we're talking about maybe buying the book. I want him to look at Sanford's great cover again. One second, one second. There we go. I want to oh, know, you just can zoom in on there's, these. There's the there's the, there's the uh, crawl, so people know where to buy the book. Oh, there you go. perfect. But uh, this I character that that Sanford uh, drew is called General Election, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have to credit uh, my partner at Yo Books and my wife Pichu Gusoni for coming up with the name. I think it's a great name. It's a playoff course on Captain. 
uh, America, but sure. a general's even higher up, and it's general election. Uh, so uh, genius. Yeah, but the real genius that put it across was Sanford's artwork, of course. Oh, yeah. Sanford, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you, you know, what all you did when you put pencil to paper and. Well, um, it's actually digital, so not too, too much oh, paper. Yeah. Little spoiler. Sorry. A bit of a spoiler. Old school. But, uh, yeah, so but now, I wanted to but get now I can't ask school. you for the original artwork for my collection. Well, you know, there, there's ways to make it work. We can talk about that <laughs> off record. Okay. But no, but um, um, I wanted to to do something, even though it was digital. I still wanted to do um, a look and style with the color, <clears throat> especially that has the old, um, you know, four color um, process feel with the. Uh, with the um gosh with the uh the dots the dot you know um, effect to it to uh to give it that that finish you know that we had when we saw you know when we got those co those comics growing up and especially because of you know these comics within the book are you know classic you know or rare rare stories or rare um collections and uh so yeah i just wanted to kind of give it um a bit of that um nostalgic feel um and i think the craig had like a um kind of a prele preliminary sketch yeah a, a, a bad uh, a bad start and uh well you know that sanford's that sanford saved me from <laughs> he showed he showed me the idea and um i just um you know tried to make it work for you know what 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 we see here now yeah, yeah it was the, a lot of fun it was fun i mean this is the saw, original sketch i i think yeah you put it in the book there you go yeah yeah but that's yeah, awesome uh, but yeah it's awesome in a bad way i mean <laughs> <laughs> no i understand well <laughs> what, i'm no uh, sanford or for or emil's but uh no well. but it's a good guide yeah, yeah i heard emil asking um are you making a poster of it and I think that's a, a tremendous idea. Hmm. Well, I think we we did a Kickstarter, but I don't. Did we do a poster of that of General Election Sanford? I don't. I don't know. I don't think I, we did. I, I think you, you could gave sell. it to you, and that was that was it. Yeah. <laughs> that's hey. But but yeah. but if 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 uh, if Can Tom I? Feelings based his character on Adam Clayton Powell, did you base General Election on any? Uh, is that your mom or your wife or your sister or? So you know, Honestly, I just took what you did and just kind of, you know, modified it in what, I, you know, what I thought it would. Well, it doesn't look anything work. like my mom or my sister. <laughs> Emil was trying to say okay. something. What were you going to ask, Emil? I was going to say, you know, I know, I know, Craig, that it's probably a bit of a disappointment. This is speaking to something that both you and Sanford said. Um, for one thing, um, you said, Craig, that it's not coming out, you know, due to the wisdom you said of Amazon, it's not coming out till a couple weeks after the election. And, and Sanford, you said something really interesting about how, you know, how relevant everything is to right now. And I think one of the things reading the book that came to me is this book is evergreen. Right. It's going to be evergreen. It's going to be because we have changed as a country. And this is going to be something that young people have in schools. This is going to be something that the yes. parents get for their kids. This is going to be something that people give to an 18 year old on their 18th birthday or even before. But this is, um, we've changed. I mean, I think as a nation, you're looking at the numbers of people voting right now and the reality. And what I wanted to say to both of you in regards to this, is something that occurred to me that I hadn't realized before. And that is that, um, we will always, and I think Sanford, you said something like um, that we haven't dealt with this yet. You know, this is an issue that we haven't dealt with. And I think that is so true. And I think um, the issue is vigilance. What we're realizing. Mm -hmm. in the right. Issue, That's a good word. Right. We have to change. And vigilance is such a great comic book name. I mean, it is exactly. <laughs> right. that we would understand this need to change our minds because we understand what vigilance is i mean there is always the group of people that are trying to subvert the will of the nation that are trying to you know capitalize on our inaction and, and so difference yes and and this is such an amazingly wonderful moment in that way yeah. and i that's why i really love the inauguration of this book 
I love the team that came together to bring it. And I love the concept that we're changing our minds, that we're becoming vigilant beings. We realize, and I mean, it's so clear in those great comics that in order to maintain a democracy, it requires maintenance. It's not something that right. you put in action and it will just like a machine keep going. Keep it requires going. maintenance, constant maintenance. Yeah. And this uh, is so exciting, you know, yeah. to talk about and to say, okay, I'm in, I'm in. What right. can I do? What can I do to make sure that happens? And I feel <clears throat> more and more that almost everyone I know is asking, what can I do? Right. What can I do, you know, and, and they're not, feeling constrained by what their life is. They're knowing that they have to set aside time for this because it matters. And so this threat to our freedom that we have experienced now in this country, um, I think it's the best thing that could have happened to us in a way, as horrible yeah. as it is. Yeah. And in so many ways. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I uh, Amelia, you have mentioned the Luca Comic Convention, I think. Earlier, I met my wife at the Luca Comic Convention. I was uh, I had uh, brought out a book and, and uh, about Mickey Mouse, and they invited me over to put on an exhibit over at the beautiful Luca Comic Convention in Italy. And my wife was was mounting the art show, and that's how I I met her. Wow. But I was when when she first came here. And we, you know, because I only knew her for a few days, and I invited her. Hey, can, you want to come live with me in the United States? So she came, and I felt I, I, I. Besides falling deeply in love with her, I learned something new about her and about Europeans when I got to know her. That they are passionate about politics. This and is it, when, absolutely. And when I, when I, uh, you know, when I met her, and, and this is you know a few decades ago now. People in America didn't talk about politics. Can you imagine? I, some people listening to me now won't even believe that. But you might remember, if you're old enough, listeners, that there was a time when we didn't talk about politics in America. It was impolite. Impolite. And it was just something you kind of did that was in the background. And, and I remember as a little kid, my, my parents, they were going to have a party, which was a rare thing in the old household. But they said, I go, well, what happens at a party? They go, well, one thing, don't talk about politics or religion. And uh, not that when I was five or six hours old, I was when I asked that question that I was going to even be a, awake by the time uh, the guests arrived or something. But they were just kind of telling me what 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 you do did and didn't do at a party. But back then, you didn't talk about politics or religion. Can you imagine that today? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. the opposite. And in, in Europe, it was the opposite. People in Europe were passionate and talked. Over you know their 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 spaghetti or their or their Greek food or their tea <laughs> or their tea or whatever about politics, but we we kept mum about it. But well, now, like you said, Emil, you know, even if maybe even if this election doesn't go like some of us feel it should, I think I think people are now involved and they are energized and they realize they're involved how involved important their involvement is, you know, and, 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 and the most democratic and the most effective thing you can do right now is, is, is to vote. Yes. Right. You know, well, you and say so, so. I was going to say, I believe in, I believe in marching and, and writing your Congress persons and whatever else you can do too. But the, it all centers ultimately on, on voting. That's, that's the most important thing we can do. <clears throat> Voting is our superpower. That's that's a good idea for a book. <laughs> but you know, I think um, just to segue what you just shared, um, I'm seeing this in real time. About an hour ago, I was at. Um, we have a young um, black guy here in South Carolina by the name of Jamie Harrison, who is becoming like a national star, oh, and it's amazing to see. I, I part. To, to Emil's point, people feel energized. They feel like instead of just protesting or or maybe even kind of silent, you know, do, being being a silent voter, if you will, people are actually out and they're being visible and they're showing their, you know, for lack of better words, their colors, if you will. Um, yeah, yeah. And I I decided to go go to this. Partly because I wanted to do something, I felt like okay, 
my first level of duty, in my opinion, was being a part of a project like this, right? Um, getting people engaged, having and starting those conversations. Okay, why is voting your superpower? How can you make it your superpower? Those kind of things. And um, I learned something about myself, a lot of what Emil just shared about how I've been kind of on the sidelines. I've been rooting and, 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 you know, grimacing at everything that took place. And I will, and I always vote, but there's still, there was something that was missing. I, I just didn't go there kind of like what, you know, uh, uh, Craig said about just how you just don't talk about it. I'm in the South and it is very, much a taboo subject until recently. And I went to this, uh, you know, I went out to this, um, this car rally, if you will, it had to have been a thousand cars out there, at least, at least. Um, I posted a video of it saying, this is different. This, this is not four years ago, even this is something totally different. And, um, you know, that's something that we can take, you know, taking uh, encouragement from uh, is seeing people are invested, you know, in it now instead of just their civic duty or whatever you want to call it. Um, they're 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 putting a lot of their interest on the line. And that's um, that's that's pretty it's scary in some ways, because, you know, I think that's part of to your point. Craig, I think that's why people didn't talk politics or religion or whatever, because they're they're protective and they don't want to offend someone or hurt someone's feelings yeah. or no, get their there feelings was, hurt. There was you know? quote, good reasons in some ways, but now we've got good reasons to speak up. <laughs> oh, and I think it depends. I think it depends on what literally when we talk about the United States, what part of the country you're in, because, yeah, I mean, being in uh, Chicago, I think it was just, well, we want to be polite. And also, well, who am I kidding? I was going to say that maybe even though uh, Democrats and Republicans may disagree how to get there, the, the, the goal at least seemed to used to be to provide for the common good. And now it is so much more obviously voter suppression. And, and, and again, depending on where you were in the country, and especially in the South, it was always there. And it's something that they don't. And, it, and it, man, I'll and tell if, you. And if I, if if, if I can say this, sure. it, depending on the color of your skin, too. Of course. Well, and that's what I was going to say. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar a couple of years ago, and it was during the Trump administration. And you know, he's been writing these incredible essays for the Hollywood Reporter, just about society. Hmm. And there's a guy that was on the front lines of the civil rights movement, even as a kid you know, as a college basketball player, standing with Ali and Jim Brown and all these important athletes that were well, saying enough. And it's so sad that 50 years later, we're still dealing with the same shit. And, 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 and I said, thank God you're out there, man, because few people have that perspective and can really be eloquent in their words. And I, I really, I, I admire the hell out of the guy because he, he truly is a Renaissance man behind his, beyond his athletics. He's such a great writer and a, and, a, and a terrific motivator in terms of the changes that are necessary. And and the, yeah, I mean, so so it is. It's a, and it really, again, Craig, in the book, you've got examples of, of Jim Crow political ads uh, that were speaking out against uh, voter suppression, and I mean, even uh, and then uh, God, incredibly golden age. But and I and it's interesting that it came from him, Windsor McKay, even yes. uh, doing uh, some. Uh, uh, political, uh, or at least uh, vo positive voting cartooning. Right, um, right, right, right. So, well, yeah, there, there's her block, which was who was who was a cartoonist who was always, you know, on the front lines. Uh, oh yeah, for political righteousness, and uh, and then one of my favorite, a uh, Chicago guy, a uh, shoemaker. Uh, yeah. There's a great cartoon in there, but Bud Plant, the retailer, he was telling me the other day how much he, he liked the shoemaker cartoon, political cartoon that's in there, and. Yeah. He was speaking. It's a cartoon about. We'll see if we can find out about the sure. stay home, stay home voter. And uh, I don't know. if <laughs> I think there's probably still some stay home voters, so maybe they'll they'll well, see it, this cartoon. To to what Amel was saying, as you're looking it up, there you go. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thanks for voting for us. It's all these corrupt kind of guys, crooked courts, and <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, is this cartoon out of today or what? Uh, Easily. Political. Uh, I, I can't even read them all. So you got these guys st standing behind this 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 guy that's a uh, uh, sitting at home. He's a stay home voter. Uh, but yeah. you got all these corrupt people that are really thrilled that he's just sitting at home rather than going to the polls. You know, so that's like Schum Schumacher, was, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, Chicago cartoonist. Absolutely. Well, to amplify what Bill was saying, yeah, we were we've been lulled into uh, indifference and and just not not participating because well, what does it matter? You know, whatever. And thank God we did wake. We've woken up in the last few years. Yeah, it's like, you know, wait a I minute. Mean, they're I, really I, they're playing I, us now. I've always been kind of interested in things like. I did a book recently about the great anti-war comic books. I've always been interested in a broad sense in, in being against war and for women's rights and stuff, but I never really felt like I wanted to soil myself and get involved in actual politics and, and voting and registration and stuff like that. And so, I, I mean, I think, I think we've over the last couple of just a couple of years, I've sort of, grown to realize the importance of, you know, of doing that. And in Sanford, I think if, if I could, if I could say this, I, I think when I first contacted you, you go to do a cover, you go, oh, that's, that's kind of an interesting idea. But I, I, it seems like in the year that you, we've been working on this together, I've sort of seen you get more engaged and that you, you got more ex excited about the book as you, in, in the, in the, in the message behind it, you know, just, haven't you like just in the past year it seems like you've you've grown about that and i saw that beautiful picture of you and your son going out and voting together sanford that was like touching but uh yeah. it seems like you you you, you kind of grew into that. this I mean, I know somewhat um, started getting me we couldn't hear you yeah I've, no yeah i've changed i mean i've changed uh, i've changed this experience has changed me uh, it has changed me. For, I'm so I'm like I would say I don't know anybody who hasn't been changed by this. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. I just think I was. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't say for me that I was utterly disenfranchised, but you know, I wasn't uh, franchised. <laughs> Let's say that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, we were um, kind of floating out there. I think or yeah. something. Well, for the longest time, I think uh, people thought of the people in power as they. Well, they're going to do yeah. what they want. And it's like, no, no, no. They represent us. We yeah. the people. And that is so important. It's basic, but you forget. And I'm not sure they understand that. <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing, man. It's well, like, no, well, wait a minute. That's the concept, and, we, and we've understood that we need to hold them to that. Right. And if, you're not, if, if they are not doing what we want them to do, we do have the ability of getting rid of them. And that's what, and it really, thank God, there's a lot of career politicians that are shitting bricks right now because their opposition has so woken up. Shit on this show. Okay. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, I, this is the show. You guys. Yeah, it's the internet. I, and also, I come from broadcasting, so it is a pleasure to speak uh, my mind. So, and uh, go ahead, Sanford, excuse I, me. I do think that there's an X factor. And the, the X factor is COVID. I think COVID. Mm. slowed everything down. Yep. Everybody had a time to be introspective and start looking at themselves. We seen it in the, you know, the racial, you know, tension and unrest. Um <clears throat> we saw that, right? And then we saw how people poured out. When I saw that, <clears throat> the thing I thought was this is going to be a different election. And 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 COVID was the catalyst to that, right? Because this stuff has always happened. Everything you just you guys just said is like we we don't pay attention to the whole fact that they work for us. We because we go about our lives. We got our comic cons to keep us busy. We got our whatever our careers, and we just live in our bubbles. And then the bubble is taken away. And now we're even in more of a bubble. We're in our own personal bubbles, and we have you know nothing but time to reflect and you see people who are in these positions absolutely i mean i think even for for those who are blatant this even more blatant than ever i think to some degree 
That's why they're doing it is because they know this is pretty much it. It's like we might as well throw everything at this thing because we know people are starting to, you know, to um, uh, Emil's point. They're now engaged. They feel it. All these senators are getting blitzed from emails and phone calls. And, you know, you can't have uh, an actual town hall, but these they're, they're feeling it. They can't even get in their offices on a day to day basis without someone challenging them. Um, you know, it started back, um, I would say, even a year ago with, you know, the Supreme Court justice thing that started to, you know, um, really raise people's awareness and start understanding, wait a minute, that that doesn't that doesn't feel right. Shouldn't we have some kind of say so in this as people, you know, those kind of things. And now, obviously, we're, we're just in in this situation where everybody has to deal with their own stuff. And either you're going to, you know, just die with this old way or you're going to fight and, and be a part of the change. Uh, a good question from Carl Bakey here. Uh, do you think writers and artists who are under contract by the big two, DC and Marvel, are nervous about doing more vote political cartoons on their own platforms? I just wonder. wonder. Yeah, yeah, Sanford, as someone who's worked recently for Marvel, <laughs> you'll forgive me. Yeah, I'm uh, only I, I'm only laughing because I know some stuff, and I anyway i i well, I do believe it spill, is spill spill. Well, I do believe, truth be told, there is a lot more. Um, liberation in doing it as a creator own. Sure. You, you know, right? I mean, we know that at the end of the day, the big two or corporations is not just Marvel Comics and DC Comics. It's their the powers that be. The ones that own them, yeah. Yeah, Disney the overseas, and, yeah. Disney and, so, and, uh, and Time Era AT&T now with uh, DC right, Comics. right. And truth be told, there's some there's some connections to political affiliations and alignments within some of that stuff, right? And so, though you may be able to make a little noise, if it makes enough noise, it is going to reach that hierarchy, mm -hmm. and you see what you know. So, um, and that that doesn't mean right or left. That just means there are affiliations, and in in either side, it's. There's more stuff, you know, um, that makes that that can make it very challenging. That's why, you know, doing a book like what we have here, what we're talking about now, is so much more beneficial, in my opinion. Um, truth be told, I mean, we we've seen stories like Captain America, you know, standing up for, and you know, we we we've got stories already out there. Honestly, Captain America, Superman, all these characters are created from political, you know, oppression. Yeah, oppression in in, in events, you know, in yes. history. So, but I think in this day and time, we need new voices because they're they're new voices that are speaking out, and they, they need to see someone that looks like them, not Captain America. <laughs> to be honest with you, right? Well, sure. But well, also, the so, comics have always been po political, uh, you know. Uh, you know, from the get go. I mean, Superman was an immigrant, and right, he was fighting the Ku Klux Klan, and he, he you know, and and uh, Captain was, America was, was punching Captain Hitler. America was yeah, punching like Nazis Nazis. Eight, mu eight but, months before we were in the war. Absolutely, man. And and Kirby and Simon paid for it, but with protesters uh, from the American Bund, the Nazi sympathizers, sympathizers of the United States, and needed police protection. When they debuted Captain America, please, Craig. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, hmm. no, but I, I just kind of dancing around what Sanford was saying too. I, I think s the corp comics are m m more corporate than ever. I mean, yeah. it, it, back when Superman was created, it was like you know two two young Jews brought to like you know. Uh, uh, a, a group of editors and publishers and printers and. Uh, you know, a group of eight people or something, you know, and, and it wasn't like a big corporation with with uh, so much media behind it and so much licensing and so much, the, the money wasn't so important right now that comics were the bottom rung of printing and publishing and, and the arts, you know, so uh, it wasn't even so important. Whatever the creators put in it, this is what they filled up the books with, you know, but now but there's it was, much, now it was there is more... 
oversight and uh you know i mean there, there was uh you know there, even in for this book there was an opportunity to use some uh I mean, all the comics in this here, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't work anyway out anyway because all the comics in here are specifically about voting, and there's there's eight of them and they're all great and they're all fascinating in their own way. But there was also some stories from the golden age that touched on voting that I kind of thought at one point to include, but uh, the people that maybe control the control the the rights to those weren't as in, as interested in that idea as i was let me just put it wow that way. that's interesting because certainly there were those uh one page public service ads yeah. to where where a lot of like superman would address racism and and, and you know uh, inclusion even in the even in the uh, golden and silver yeah, age i would love to do a collection of those but again it's uh it's not it's not a, a, always easy these days you know i i the, the all the material in this book was public domain and it if there's ever comics that should be in the public domain, it's comics about voting, you know. So you so would it, think. So it yeah. worked out. So that worked out good. Uh, the, uh, I was going to say real fast that uh, as someone who worked for CBS Radio several times over my radio career, and in my last uh, job uh, with uh, WBBM, the the news station here in Chicago, uh, we had a very um, frank talk about expressing your own personal political views. Right. And it wasn't done with any malice. It literally was the, uh, it's a 50% uh, country. And, and right. we don't want to, I mean, ultimately, it's like, we don't want to lose wis listeners based yeah. on your political opinions. Well, and even, they, and even they did me, ask me bringing out this book, I'm, I'm not uh, Warner Brothers or Disney, but, you know, I thought like, gee, I'm going to bring out this book. And it, it you know, in a, in a way, it kind of, it's nonpartisan. I don't mention any partic particular politicians that are up for election as an example. But I think people that know me and and, and read between the lines see that I, I kind of lean towards certain ideas and and uh, core beliefs, you know. And uh, uh, But I thought, you know, I'm, I've probably, you know, I've maybe lost, you know, and we're a small operation. We can't afford to lose uh, uh, half or even a tenth of our uh our, our our audience you know but i felt like this is important you know this is this is something i want to say this is i i i'm going to do this because i'm going to be proud of it that i, I you know it may not sway the election <laughs> I, I i hope it does but it may not but i'm proud that you know i i, I said something and you know with the help of uh sanford and then emil uh, cheering us on on the back cover and and you know i'm i'm just proud that w you know we're, we're taking a stand and that we can uh look ourselves in the mirror and look at you know i can look at my children and say i tried <laughs> i tried i tried my best in my own little limited world and way i'm sure what we've been talking about emil is inspiring some thoughts from you and i feel bad that we've been you know kind of monopolizing the last few minutes she's so, so smart we do need to hear from her go ahead emil you know, what's great about Emil Sanford? Oh, you kind of touched so on this, but Emil, like, she oh, has her own oh, independent sorry, book. She can say what she wants, True. and have, and you know, you know, and has she's unfettered, you know. So I, I think she's she's in a great position to get ideas across. Emil, talk to us about that. Well, uh, I will say that um, I had an instance where a very beloved person in my life was living in extremely close proximity to um, some very um, radicalized people in Washington state. And I did not feel free during that time to do a lot of things that I would have otherwise done. Um, mm. Because I knew that she had been very uh, involved in some anti-racism and uh, had been, had a profile in that world. And I was concerned uh, about what I, I mean, I had to really face that. I had to face that because the episodes of uh, terrorism in our country have been by uh, white supremacists. I mean, let's That's just right. face that, that has yeah. been what happened. So, and I mean, you know, it goes, of course, deeper into our history, but um, what I've been thinking about a lot is, uh, you know, I've been watching Lovecraft Country, I've been uh, watched Watchmen, 
and uh, I'm reading Lovecraft Country now, or actually I finished it. Um, but what, I, what I've been thinking about is the way we're haunted by our history. And I think that these, these, this is what we're, we understand to be the truth. And it's something that I think we realize we have to deal with. Um, I had an episode in Quebec where I took a residency and it was haunted. It was straight up haunted. I experienced a real ghost. Um, nothing like that has ever happened in my life. Um, the person, I was informed after I got there that the person in, that took the residency before me left in tears in the middle of the night swearing they'd never oh go back. Oh my gosh, wow. Yeah, because it was, it was, um, wow. it, you know, did you ever see the, uh, the movie uh, Paranormal Activity? I remember that movie. Okay, where, I mean, just like things. Were, oh yeah, I mean like, you know, you know you didn't put a chair on a table. Like, you know you didn't do that. Like, you know you didn't do that. Wow. I mean, yeah, wow. And so, when, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was a lot of things, but I'm, you know. So what I'm telling you is that uh, I think ghosts are really a part of our lives. I think we're dealing with a past that we think is gone because we don't see it. But there's every chance in the world that it's really here. And I think that, um, I think we all have a baseline of goodness, even the worst among us. And we know when what we are does not resonate with that goodness. And we know when what we do in our lives, and I'm no different, I'm, I'm flawed, I'm utterly flawed. I, know, I think we know when there is no parallel between, or those two things can't hold hands, you know, what we are and, and, and what, what we do. And I think there are a lot of people in the country right now who are experiencing dissonance. And they're applying a certain kind of uh, numbing quality to the dissonance in their souls. They know that there's something wrong, um, but they aren't identifying it correctly. And I think it's really interesting because we constantly go back to this idea of the corporation. And, you know, I say this in public speaking an awful lot. If, if, you're, if you're being told that that this is a lateral problem, that you can look across the way laterally and you can see the problem over here. It's this person who came to your country without papers. It's this person who you identify as the other for whatever that means to you. They're lesbian, they're gay, they're, they're, they're trans, uh, they're different color than you, whatever that, their culture is different than yours, their religion, that's a lie. I mean, it's always those people who are being told, look laterally. It's always the, the question to them is, have you looked up? <laughs> you know? Because the people who are teaching you this are right above you. And they, and they don't want you to look up and go, oh, wait. In Norway, a person who works at McDonald's gets $20 an hour. And I get eight? And I can barely live on that? Like, um, they don't want you to know that you know, in another country, even just north of here, people don't die of COVID because they're afraid to go in to um, get medical care. And we've just recently, a uh, Brodner, um, is it Simon Brodner, uh, Steve Brodner, Steve Brodner is a brilliant cartoonist. And he just did a, a piece about a woman whose husband just died because none of the medical staff it was in Kentucky. Nobody told him that he could receive free treatment for COVID. He went in three times in emergency in the emergency room, and he ended up suffocating to death. And and that didn't have to happen. Yeah. He should have received medical care. But you know what? He was afraid. He was a strong man. He was between jobs, and he was afraid that if he got this bill, it would hurt his family. Or and like I, I think you're touching on too is people are afraid to go in. And be treated for COVID because then maybe next year they can't get uh, they can't exactly. get treatment for something else because they have a pre-existing right. condition. Yep, exactly. And and and, 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 and running, you know, four hundred billion dollars are spent on the on, on our our military. That's their budget per year, and we don't have universal health care in this country. I mean, there there there's there's something wrong with that. Well, clearly there's an e there's a massive economic problem, and the last time there was a massive economic problem this big, the government responded with you know the the, the public works programs of the 30s, 
and yeah. and and you say that now, and oh, well, that's socialism. Socialism sounds like communism, and it's just the the without really understanding that uh, it's in the Constitution, promote the general welfare and right. secure the blessings of liberty. And it's like yes. that's your job. That's right there. And again, uh, we forget. And it, and and I go back to that idea of well, they're going to do what they want, so my vote doesn't matter. And it's like no, it does. And you you have the power to change things because this has to happen. Sanford, go ahead. It looked like you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I think you know in real time as we're having this very conversation, everything you guys are saying, what are they doing? They're they're shoehorning in, you know something that clearly should be left to the people. Even besides that, I guess, if you're able to do that, why can't you give or pass some type of legislation or bill to help with the conditions yeah. because of what's happening in real time? Hospitalizations are skyrocketing as we speak. Um, I, I'm pretty sure we've all known someone who's had COVID or we had it ourselves, even worse. Yeah. I've known a guy that passed away from, from it already. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, as sad as that is yeah. going back to some of the points you guys were making earlier, because of this type of thing, this thing is affecting people personally. Now, this is not just them passing legislation that kind of is behind closed doors and doing it in the middle of the night. And we're, we're off because we're off doing our own thing. We don't, we're, we're all stuck and they're passing these, these, you know, absolutely absurd, you know, uh, legislation right now that makes, that does nothing for any of us. And I think that is absolutely some, See, see change type stuff because people are now going, wait a minute. It's kind of like what Emil said. It's like now they're looking up. Like, wait a minute. That means this is what you normally, this is wh who you really are. There's some people, unfortunately, that they're, they're okay with that. Um, they're going to eventually feel it as well, <laughs> unfortunately. I wish nothing ill on anyone, but this thing is this 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 pandemic is absolutely some. I would even say, you know, Emil, you used the whole you know uh, uh, concept. I wouldn't even say concept of of understanding of ghosts. I think this is some some level of there's something else. We're dealing with a plague, if you really think about it. Of course, and it is. Like we we're not going to just pretend is not here like whatever they're saying well we just got to have to someone said something the other day about surrendering to it it's just going to have to exist within i'm like every other country first world especially has fought it unify you know right unify yes front. and things like masks aren't politicized they're like, not right. politicized right so what on what planet do you think we're going to just go, yeah, that he, yeah, that's, that's, he has a point there. I guess I'll just have to do, no, I mean, <laughs> most people, most people, there's some, but most are going to just totally just, you see it. If you walk out your door and you'll see it, you'll see people are literally living and going through it in real time. They're not listening to this nonsense. Right. Great. Yeah. It's, it's the people that lived a half in the 20th century and, and a half in the 21st century know that um, there was, the, again, a, the government worked differently. And again, maybe I'm being naive because maybe, maybe the, you know, again, I think depending on where you live and especially being in Chicago sometimes that the will of the people wasn't necess necessarily addressed. But I do really, I mean, yeah, it's so basic, but if you want change, you have to participate. And that's the thing. And I do think, as everyone has said, People are waking up and they are participating and they do, they see the, the what's going on, what we used to, as Sanford said, going on under the table, it's happening in broad daylight now. And, and they see uh, the, the, the gall and, and the, 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 bla the brazenness of these actions and are like, no, this has to stop. And I really do hope that a lot of these 
career jerks uh, are are shown the door. And I and I really I mean that that's my hope. And I you know I, I, Emil and I are in a in a predominantly blue state. Although once you get out of Cook County, it gets uh, it gets pretty conservative. And I see the look on Emil's face. She oh, knows yeah. what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, yeah. I've, never, I've never gone into a shop in Southern Illinois that I didn't get followed so closely and uh, as though I was. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you mean comic shops, or you mean like you know I mean, every shop? I, I get followed, like, and if I why, why, why do they follow you? I don't get it. Well, if I if I'm if I'm wearing a and this happened in Wisconsin, if I'm wearing a headscarf, I mean it's oh. yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm treated like uh, I'm the next person who's going to do something terrible. I wasn't even. I was in Wisconsin, and I went into this place to get coffee. I was with a friend of mine, and I have an eye problem, so I had a headscarf on, and uh, they they were very. They wouldn't even serve me. They would not serve me, and I thought, wow, yeah. I I was like, no uh, kidding, because you had a headscarf on. Yeah, so that it just I. I mean, wow. I'm not. This is nothing, really. I mean, this is so small because I can take the headscarf off. But um, it just, it just said to me, "How do you live in this world if you're?" And I, I know because I have friends who are Muslim, and I've actually encountered people being assaulted while being Muslim. And I just, you know, and that was during more during the Iraq War. And I look at it and I think, um, you know, I think it's our ghosts. It's our legacy. Uh, it's our legacy of genocide, our legacy of slavery, our legacy. You know, we we are going to have to really deal with it. We've got to. We've got to stand up to it now and really engage in a long-term national discussion about what this has made us. And well, how, can, how can we as cartoonists and people in the comic industry, you know, this this book is, there's other books that address this kind of stuff too. This book was our little way of doing that, but how can how can we going forward in the comics industry and as creators do more in an, in a, in a, in a creative way? Because I I don't think we should necessarily just be creating hardcore propaganda, though there's a role for that too, propaganda for good. But as creators, how should we? How can we be more? involved and in, and in, in affect more change and, and and speak 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 for good rather than evil well i think we in a sense we kind of um we've been ahead of this or at least we were influenced by a lot of this when we started um our series bitter root because we someone asked a question on our, I think the panel yesterday, how, what, what, um, kind of jump started our, um, venture into doing bitter root. And I said, uh, 2016, <laughs> you know, the election. And right mm -hmm. after that, we, we saw a lot of uncertainty, strife, unrest, um, a, a lot of, um, I guess the, the word is, uh, you know, the people started to feel like if this is the best we got, then what, what point is there? So, it, you know, people, have, you know, they, a loss of enthusiasm, if you will, at that point, we're at a, we were at our lowest, but then something dawned on, um, myself and many others we just started talking similar to what you said craig how can we but we gotta speak about this going back you know to what we said earlier you know 90 percent of our most beloved characters were created from some social unrest in it throughout history you know the captain americas the supermans and so on and so forth yes all those characters are tragic tragedy stories to be honest with you i mean barely any of these characters had you know parents they you know they had all this social strife <clears throat> personal you know personal and you know social socially abroad and i'm like what what is the what is this generation's what can we do to create the next generation of stories and characters if you will um to tell stories for for this this moment in in time in history and that's when we just started to 
brainstorm ideas in in that's honestly the uh how uh, bitter root came to inception and um we've had i can't even begin to tell you how many discussions we've had just like this because of what we did with our book um scholars all over the country all over the world even reaching out to us saying we were using your book as a um as curriculum for for you know our classes and uh, things of that nature um yeah so you know that's at least what we're doing now i want to continue to do more of that kind of stuff i want more stories to come out like that we're, we're to some degree we're trying to open the door for other creators to come through the door um at image and, and other publishers um uh, that have diverse stories uh so yeah we're 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 trying to we're continuing to do um the things that we feel um will really re uh, will truly resonate with people by telling stories that are about something we all can identify with because we're not just talking about solely racial and um you know civil unrest and things of that nature you know that's kind of the undercurrent our story is honestly about family i don't care what background you come from it's about the, the, the core of the story is about family but then we take that and we say okay how does the family deal with racial social unrest uh things of that nature how do they see it there's different opinions within the family we all can relate to that you know um not everyone is completely unified on ways to approach it. So I say that to say that's where we get the most um, rich, rich discussions on because there's that one core thing that every last one of us can talk about. And then we branch into the deeper, you know, stories. It's interesting that you mentioned families because, you know, the, the cartoonists that, that, that did these comic books in the, in the fifties during the, uh, the 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 uh uh tension between uh russia and in the united states and then the mccarthy the, era sure the red yeah, scare the mccarthy area the red scare area and, and then uh and and then the cartoonists who did these comics about voting during the civil rights era they they they've they've zeroed in a, a number of the books deal with family like this this one I, i'm kind of amused and uh sorry hold on one second about about this comic there we go if your kids could it's a comic and you can see the cover here if yeah. your kids could vote you know so it, it's all based on the family and the kids like a like a, a greta thornberg and uh david hogg uh, brother and sister like are chiding their parents because they're not planning on voting you know and the kids the kids the, so the cartoonist came up with an idea like let's 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 you know let's let's have a thing about kids and family and then the the, the next book one of this which I showed before an American family gets out the vote you know it's it's and then uh, the later double in NAACP uh, comic uh, is uh, the street where you live you know and it's the cover is a is is a black mom with her son w walking down the street and. I think that comic books, when I grew up, it was just uh, so much about being, you know, teenage Spider-Man, you know, and I related to him as a teenager. But now, like what Sanford's talking about and these comic books of old, old, it was about family. And even like I'm thinking now, like there was a comic book called Superman's Family. And, and I don't think comic books address family enough and in, in, in the that core group that can have so much power i i actually know uh based on background conversations that uh, during the new 52 dc dissuaded the creators from thinking of the characters as being family and it's so ridiculous given oh. the, the the idea of legacy that started with the golden age characters the silver age characters into the newer generations of these heroes and it's like no 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 our heroes are outlaws they got to be bad they got to be outlaws well we all see how well that worked 
And now they are embracing the idea of family and that. Emil, I wanted to ask, uh, based on my favorite things as monsters, uh, the fact that uh, it, it is set in the 60s and in the political uh, Chicago environment that you grew up in and everything. So you really are dealing with, you know, personal issues uh, amidst this per this political backdrop in your books. I just wanted you to talk. About yeah, you know, it's amazing uh, just how much things don't change, right? I mean, yeah, because I remember as a kid, uh, I remember the protests. I remember running into protests. I remember walking into them and uh, and having, um, you know, I mean, and I brought my daughter to protests of the Iraq War. Um, and I and during the '60s, I remember the the fear. You know, I remember the intimidation. I remember. Um, that the lines were drawn in this really weird way. And, you know, um, we don't have to do that. I think that we're being engineered towards a civil war. I think that that's what's really the attempt is being made to bring us to a state of civil war. And we can say, because we're going to lose. I mean, everybody loses. That's the thing. The people who think that they stand to win anything in this situation are completely deluded. Whoever is engineering this wants to take everything they've got. And that's the deal. I mean, they've got to wake up because this is this is like the con. You know, this is when the guy is saying, hey, I've got this coin, you know, and it's worth a lot, but the pawn shop's closed. This is the point where you've got to realize there's no, there's, there's no guy going to buy this for $50,000, guys. You're going to lose everything you've got. You're, you're, you're right in the middle of the con. And it, the con is to divide us. We are brothers and sisters, and I kind of wish the aliens would come. I just always, I find myself going, you know, this, this would be so good for us. Like, come on, you can, you can you're always <laughs> driving. Why, why don't you just land and really, really announce your presence? Because, look, I'm going to align with, with non-tentacles. That's how it's going to be, right? I don't know, though. I got to say, Emil, uh, having remembering the 80s miniseries and television show V, I have a feeling based on our current politicians, there are going to be collaborators that will be very happy to warm up. Hail to our new tentacle uh, overlords. They're, they're right. <laughs> so I, don't I was just going to make yeah. the joke. I say, who, say, who says that they're not, not already here? They're, they may already oh, nice. Be. There you go. Yeah. They may already be here with all this, this Wait insanity that's happening. It's almost like you work for comic books or something to say something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, he keeps talking about the X Factor. I think I keep thinking, is that a is that a Marvel comic book? Isn't it? Exactly. It's probably an X Men right, I, 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 I want to acknowledge some great uh, comments that people are saying. And uh, Carl says, over the last five years, breaking into comics for the first time, I'm so grateful for creators like yourselves who don't avoid giving a voice to the voiceless, especially in the smallest press. Thank you. Michael says, I'm in Canada with family in the States. Truly hope America makes the right choice for all its citizens and their well-being. Uh, oh, this is great. Uh, there you go. Uh, somebody just purchased the book via Clover Press. That's good. I'm glad no, the that matters. Cool. And uh, then, uh, you know, uh, I want to say his name right. Eternatine Forever uh, says X Men was a family book. Absolutely, oh yeah, that's true. Family book, Power Pack, Thor, all family themes, all agreed. And yeah, uh, yeah, a, yeah. A question for Sanford: uh, They want to know when the handsome Bitterroot hardcover is coming to the states. Um, after Volume Three, uh, we'll, we'll be launching Volume Three in March, I think. And well, we're launching the the third. Um, the third arc in March, and then uh, we'll collect um, that in June, July, and so we'll, you know this time. So next year, August, okay. September. Uh, the legend wants to uh, congratulate Craig for bringing Popeye to IDW a while back. Loved Roger Landrids and the Sagendorf uh, classics. Also loved the Reefer Madness book that you put together. <laughs> <laughs> I love that pop. Yeah, I do. I do books for the good of mankind and person kind, and I do books that maybe aren't so good. That's <laughs> all right. No, that's cool. Um, but guys, Popeye, going... hey, if 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 ever if ever there was someone we should that would should be a role model in for us today, it's certainly Popeye, who was always fighting for the little guy and 
on the side of right. I completely agree. I'm a ba- massive Popeye fan in the right hands. Yeah. Man. I was, man, I don't know if you saw, and I don't know who made it, but they they tried to kind of politically correct Popeye, and they took the pipe out of his mouth and they gave him a whistle. <laughs> and uh, it, it just was just insanely like, no, man, it's like, come on, you're kind of missing the point here. But whatever, it's fine. He was whistling anyway, though. He, you know, he, he got, you know, his tobacco out of the way. Once he gets that out of the way, he can whistle. So it's kind of like... That wasn't tobacco that was in his pipe. He had talked about it as being spinach, and uh, which but might true. be a euphemism. Yeah. That might go yeah. back to my Reefer Madness book, actually. So <laughs> Spinach. Sure it is. That's but great. Popeye, was, Popeye was an influence. He was the first superhero before Superman. He, he was costumed in his sailor outfit, and and he, uh, you know, he, he ate spinach and became strong and fought uh, fought bad guys like Brutus. And we have a few Absolutely. Brutuses around right now that he, he should give a twister sock to. I think. Absolutely, man. Um, do we? I mean, we've been going ninety minutes, guys. I, I do. Do anything else that we want to say before we wrap up? Oh, I, I did want to show one more page from the book sure. if I could. Of course, because it's the it's the first comic we have in there, and it's. Uh, since we're kind of wrapping Oops. up, I, I, I think this is here we go. This is one. This is an important one. Your your vote is vital. Agreed. It's the first book comic that we reprint. Uh, vote, and they're all putting their uh, in their ballots for America's future. Uh, so uh, I, I, you know, I think that's a that's a pretty pretty good summation. That was a Harvey comic book. The same people that put out Casper and Hot Stuff and all those great horror comics and Richie Rich. Richie Rich, and uh, <laughs> so uh, to make up for Richie Rich, they put out some comics. This comic about voting. They, there they you did go. Three or four. Go. They did three or four of the comics that were in this. They, had a, they, they must have had a uh, felt a mission to get out the word of word about democracy. The Harvey and, brothers. And Dave Foley wants to say hello, Sanford. Very cool. Oh, you have a oh, fan there. Hey, David. There you go. Excellent. Uh, Emil, uh, when's your next? When you, when's your next book uh, coming out? Indeed. How's, Emil, I could pretend like I um, like I was frozen. I was thinking about just pretending like, and, <laughs> and then like, oh, no, how would you know? Stop. And then I, <laughs> when it when is it? I thought you were. <laughs> You might, you're, you're working. You're he, working hot and heavy on a on a new book, right? I can't say. I'm just not. I just can't say. Well, okay. All right. Interesting. Secret. Because truly, Emil, I really do want to get you on if you'd be willing uh, in a in a one on one conversation to talk more about your stuff. And really, uh, I, it's it's congratulations because it really it is a, a. I didn't know how to contact you, and I'm so glad that uh, this opportunity came up to, to finally meet you. And oh. it would be great to talk more about uh, about your work because absolutely. She's a, she's a genius, a recognized genius. Uh, I have a Both question. Her and her have all those awards on their mantles. And... Um, if, if your house caught fire, would that drawing, that you, those that double sign drawing, those two drawings be what you grab to leave with? God Among willing. them, I, I have walls of, and you really can't see, I'll try and point the camera a little bit, maybe. I mean, there you go. You can see a few more commissions oh, that wow. I have on the walls. Yeah, I've been I've been incredibly fortunate, and uh, and really bought a lot of my art before the prices really exploded. Yeah. But I have and, and before the, the people like and before Sanford started doing digital, you know, <laughs> breaking our hearts. It's true, it's yeah. true. But and also, thankfully, doing fifteen years of podcasting, oh, a yeah. lot of the artists are, are friends. And they've given me a nice friend rate, but oh. it's funny. You, Craig mentioned Dick Ayers. Um, I have a, a piece that he did for me in the early two thousands. I've always loved that one brief moment where Iron Man's faceplate had those points at the top. Oh yeah. I don't know how long it lasted. I first saw it on one of those Marvel superhero cartoons of the sixties, and it just fascinated me. And I asked Mister Ayers to do that, and he did a beautiful, perfect, you know, job of of doing that. So that's a great piece, and yeah, I've been. I mean, really, Tony DeZaniga. I've got a, a Jonah Hex from him, and I have a blade that uh, Gene Colan made for me that I absolutely love. So yeah, I, I, no, I, I, I risk getting burnt, uh, Emil, to uh, to save a lot of my original art. 
children and our families. But what about you, Sanford? What would you say? I mean, I know your families are your families are already safe. Oh but yeah, what, what that, object? Good, good, uh, good cover for me by saying that. Because um, yeah, I, you know, of course the family. But um, as far as like any kind of, I actually I started a, a small collection. But, be, but before the family, what what are we <laughs> before the family? <laughs> No, I, second. Uh, what, what would you say? I can't. I, um, I don't know if I can tilt my camera just a bit because on the top of my spinner rack here, okay, is um, yeah. I don't want you to, you know, hurt yourself. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, you see it? up here? Maybe not. Yeah. yeah. I have, uh, Ooh, what's yeah. that? A modesty blaze. Um, oh, oh blaze. that's nice. And um, wow. I forgot the other the other um, comic uh, strip there, but um, it was kind of thrown in uh, because the buyer, I mean the seller, just said, "Hey, because of the um, the rate that he gave me on the other piece, he just threw it in." And uh, wow! Gave me a strip. So I got a Mod Modesty Blaze, Jim Holdaway, um, uh, Peter O'Connell. Um, yeah, I'm a fan of that stuff. Me too, man. That's yeah, amazing. Fan of that stuff. I know a lot of they're they're kind of uh, Jim Holdaway is kind of like an artist artist. Uh, a lot of guys, you know, look to him like um, John Paul Leon is influenced by him, and you know, he's an artist artist. Um, yeah, folks like that. But yeah, um, yeah, that stuff like that, um, I would probably grab and. and Kelly, then I, Kelly then a big modesty place person. Excuse me, I didn't mean to uh, stop. Oh, you there, Kelly, so. she is. Yeah, she, oh, okay. she loves. And so there's a conversation you should have down oh, there. Yeah. With yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, continue. Craig, Craig, I'm asking you. Okay, there oh, you go. Me. Uh, well, our, our whole living room is uh, George Harriman Crazy Cat originals. Wow. Wow. We've got about a, a dozen of those. And then our whole bedroom is uh, uh, Windsor McKay, Little Nemo, oh, and uh, Dreams of the Rare Bit Fiend uh, originals. So. Wow. Th those are probably nearest and dearest to my heart. Um, yeah. So, so I, I would try to get those. Be better, be close. What's you that? Better keep, you better keep those close. Actually, yeah. we might need to talk. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Make a trade. Exactly. Oh, yeah, there you go. Oh, oh you're going to send me some pixels for uh, <laughs> the little demo Sunday page. Oh, great. I'll send, you, yeah, I'll, I'll send you one high-res version of the cover. <laughs> wow, that's an offer I can refuse. And do I will you, and I will burn the file after that. So Emil and Sanford, do you guys do you guys do commissions? Do you do you both do commissions? Um, I I don't uh, right now because of the schedule. Um, sure. So yeah. Okay, Emil, do you do commissions? I don't know if she can hear me. She's frozen again. Not right now. No. I'm too busy. Okay. Yeah. Understood. I mean, um, yeah. That's good. No, no, no. We want, as I yeah. always say, more so about when people like uh, don't come on the podcast and they're like, oh, I'm really sorry. I've been on the show in a long time. I'm like, uh, it's better that you make the donuts than talk about making the donuts. And I right. would say it's better to for you guys to make your books rather than uh, take commissions and stuff. So Speaking of making good. books, can, can I show you a book we, we the sure. UPS guy just brought? Yeah, I saw it on the mantle earlier. Please. Yeah, we finally wow. got uh, Invisible Men. Beautiful. And it's the subtitle is The Trailblazing Black Artists of Comic Books. And uh, it profiles uh, well over a dozen uh, early Golden Age uh, cartoonists and presents uh, their work and fascinating uh, background material about all of them. And there's a lot of artists here that nobody even knew were black. And uh... oh, now Bud's frozen. Oh no. Is everyone else, all right, can everyone else hear me okay? Good, I wanna I make sure my connection's okay. All right, I... Bud's in the Phantom Zone, unfortunately, right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what, the... you know, cool. I'll, I'll tell you, yeah, no, that's fantastic because I, I certainly know about Ma the great Matt Baker and his incredible work, and I, I'm a, a massive fan of anything that he's done. I love it rhymes. I want to say it's either it rhymes with lust or it rhymes with dust, 
the uh, graphic novel he made with Arnold Drake in the 50s that a lot of people point to as the first graphic novel because it was a 64-page one-story kind of great crime noir story that he did and his beautiful Phantom Lady work. My God, what a what a genius. I, those. I, I don't know anything about those. Absolutely. All right, we lost Craig. Um, maybe, what was maybe, John, could you send me those names? Because uh, I'd like to get those. That sounds really interesting to me. Oh, uh, uh, about Matt Baker and that, or on Invisible Men? Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm sh I imagine that it's... Uh, the page one I'm interested in. Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely, Emil, absolutely. I, yeah, because they... I want to say Dark Horse reprinted it um, within the last 10 years, and I've seen it out there and stuff. And yeah, it's great. It really is great. So that's, and seriously, that's so fantastic, Emil. You'll forgive me. But honestly, um, there's no need necessarily to reach back. And, and certainly your work is so personal and in a different vein of comics. And again, I, I, I hope it's not, you know, this is meant as a compliment. I, I love when you know people are like wait a minute you know i never found this stuff before that's really cool and it's great that you're discovering stuff like mike Allred and ecstatic and things like that i mean yeah, that's yeah. that's terrific well it's it's exciting i mean i just there's so much i didn't know um and now i know you know um <laughs> yeah. no, I it's, enjoy it. it's it's and so much of it is beautiful there's so many incredible artists working in comics and i think right now it's a renaissance I think there are more people, more amazing people working in comics than maybe in the history of comics. Uh, I it agree. Just seems like it's it's so rich, and uh, I just love the way comics is is people are realizing, even people my age who never read comics, I did as a kid and even you know throughout my life. But there are people who've never read a graphic novel or a comic of any kind, and they're getting in. They're diving, and they're they're enjoying it. And uh, wow, it's it's great. Makes me real well, happy. Th thankfully, truly, no, no, not blowing smoke up your butts here. But really, it's because of books like what you're doing, Emil, and also Sanford as as well, and the guys with yeah. Bitter Root, and that it's not just superheroes. And thank God yeah. for the last twenty five years, the genres have opened up again. And we're 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 at the same genre level we were in the 40s and 50s, but like you said, more and more people are making them. And because of creator own books and Kickstarter and all the crowdfunding efforts, that there are more voices than ever in comics. And that's why when people are like, oh, how do I break into comics? And I always hear this from a lot of the more successful guys, like just start making them, and then you're in comics. I mean, you can do it yourself. And then yeah, you know, you still have to gather your audience, but it is possible and stuff. And you know, it's 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 terrific. So I was I was going to try and let uh, Sanford or I, pardon me, Craig come back, but uh, I don't know I don't know. Uh, and again, we're, we're we've go, we've been going for an hour and forty five. So, uh, like I said, I if there to, are any other final thoughts, I have to confess I, I disconnected him on purpose so that we can. <laughs> right on. now that he's out of the room, <laughs> getting late. Really Who knew you had these powers, Sanford? Hey, I tell you what. Emil, we'll talk after this. I'll show you how you can, you know, you can get out of interviews a little quicker. <laughs> wow. I was going to say, I, I've experienced that with Sanford. It's all right. No, it's just a, just a, you know, we're, you know, I'm trying to get back. I got a deadline stuff. And, oh, know, please. Stuff guys, here. honestly, I've loved this conversation. And yeah. truly, I think it's important what you guys did contributing to Craig's book. Everyone, you can see it right there at the bottom of the, bar, uh, the, the page. Voting is your superpower. An incredible book from Craig Yo from uh, Yo Books. You could buy it via cloverpress.us or through Bud Plant Comics, two great distributors, and uh, that deserve uh, this book deserves your attention, especially as, as we have the March to Election Day. So again, uh, Craig Yo, thank you. Sanford Green, thank you very much. Emil Ferris, and, uh, and truly look forward to future conversations with all three of you on an individual basis, if, if you're willing. I don't know if you might be sick. You might be sick of me after two hours. I can appreciate that as well. Thank you, John. Nice to meet you, Sanford. Bye, Craig. Well, everybody, thanks a lot for watching. Great questions, as always. And as I end every broadcast, especially during these... Uh